Thank you. Okay, how many people have ever said to themselves or to a colleague or to a client, let's tell stories with these data? We're gonna tell a story with these data. What, what, what do you wanna tell? What's a story you wanna tell? Okay, come on, raise your hands, it's okay. We've all done it. We've all sat there and said, I'm making this column chart, I'm gonna tell a story with these data. And I'm gonna make the case to you today that we are not telling stories with data. That we are all using those words incorrectly. And that we need to be using the word story less flippantly and more carefully so that when we actually do tell stories, we're doing so in careful, purposeful, and strategic ways. Now, stories, there we go, stories are important. They help us re recognize and remember information. And we have been telling stories as a species for thousands of years, from drawings on cave walls to sitting around the campfire to writing books to operas to plays to now to tablets and cell phones and to probably, unfortunately, virtual reality. We've been telling stories. And yet we are not telling stories with data. Most of us, most of the time, are just making graphs. We're just making a point. I have a friend who used to work for the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama's administration. And they were sometimes tasked with working on issues related to Native Americans, especially Native American children, issues about alcoholism, suicide, school dropout rates. And they would collect some data and they'd write a little report and then it sort of gets sidetracked a little bit because something else would come up. And it would come back and they would try to get more data and data on Native American reservations is, is notoriously poor. And so they would work on it a little bit more and it gets shoved off to the back. And then in 2014, President Obama and the First Lady went to the Dakotas to visit some of the Native American reservations and they sat down with some of the kids in these tribal reservations. And President Obama and Michelle Obama come back and the Washington, Report, Washington Post reports when they came back, he and the First Lady emerged stunned and emotional from a meeting with six students who spoke of lives affected by homelessness, alcoholism, poverty, and suicide. And from that moment, issues about children on Native American reservations became a priority at the Council of Economic Advisors. They started collecting the data. They started doing the research. They started writing reports. They started to Im implement and affect policy and change policy, all because the president and the first lady heard stories from these children on these Native American reservations, because that's the power of stories, because they make us feel and they can spur us to action and affect change. And yet when we make our line charts and our bar charts and our pie charts, we're not telling stories with data, even though we say to ourselves and we say to our friends, let's tell a story with these data. We're not doing that. So we have graphs like this, and we say, oh, here's a story. This is not a story. When I talk to people in the data visualization field and I say, how do you think about telling stories with data? This is what they tell me. I say, okay, first thing I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna show you the space. Okay, I'm gonna show you an x-axis and a y-axis. I'm gonna label it, I'm gonna show you the grid lines. I'm gonna, this is gonna go over time, I'm gonna start that way. And then, I'm gonna put a line on the chart. Okay, here's the line for expenditures and this thing's gone up over time and it flattened out. And then, I'm going to show this line for revenues and it fell and then it declined and went up like that. And this may or may not be a story except that most of us, most of the time, are just handing graphs and charts to one another in our blogs, in our memos, in our briefs, in our reports. And sometimes, and in my opinion, not often enough, we can add annotation, we can add pieces of text, things that can direct the user, the reader's attention around the graphic. But when we're making graphs like this, we're not actually telling stories. This is from the Detroit Free Press. That's just an animated GIF. That people are saying we're telling stories with data, but what's, what's the difference here between me giving you that static graph in the report versus something like this? Part of it is the animation. Part of it is driving towards something. And so I have two things I'm gonna talk about what I think defines a story. And stories become so much more important for a number of different reasons when it comes to data, one of them being Hans Rosling, who unfortunately passed away a couple of weeks ago. Hans Rosling popularized this idea that we can make data engaging, that we can tell tales and narratives and stories, and it doesn't always have to be line charts and bar charts. We can get excited about data, we can pile rocks on top of each other, we can use washing machines. We can see how we can tell stories and make a point with data and make it engaging and make it exciting. And some of the top podcasts these days have to do with story. People are engaged with story and they want to hear story. And so as people who are working with data, 
we can also tell story, but we need to do so in careful ways. Okay, so let's begin by defining what is story. So we go all the way back, and Aristotle defines story as something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's not totally satisfactory to me. Lots of things have beginning, middles, and ends, and they're not necessarily stories. Big tower infographics may have beginning, middles, and ends, but they're not really stories. I think there are two things we need in stories to make characteristics of stories. First is we need emotion. Something that makes us feel viscerally, not something that's sort of, you know, light. Something that makes us feel and spurs us to action, makes us want to do something. In his book, The Unpersuadables, Will Storr says, a story is a description of something happening that contains some form of sensation or drama. And he continues, it is, in other words, an explanation of cause and effect that is soaked in emotion. It's this soaking in emotion that takes data from just a point or an argument that we're making to something that makes people feel and makes them do something. And we all have different types of emotion. Surprise, expectation, happiness, sadness, awe. And we all experience emotion at different levels in different ways. But what I'm talking about is deep emotion that makes us care. So I could show you this graph of Tableau stock price. And if you work for Tableau or you hold stock in Tableau, you may be really sad last year when the stock fell by 50%. Right? Now, at the same time, if you worked for Click, you might be really happy that the stock fell by that much. Right? But this isn't making us feel at a visceral level. And so what I'm talking about is creating data and pairing that with stories that make us and make our readers and make our users feel. The second thing I think we need for stories is a meaningful climax. In his book on story, Robert McKee writes, a story is not an accumulation of information strung into a narrative, but a design event to carry us to a meaningful climax. And that's what these animations allow us to do, that we don't know how the thing ends. And so we're driving towards this meaningful climax. When I read a book, I have to go left to right, top to bottom. It doesn't mean the story goes one, two, three, four, five, because remember the old choose your own adventure books, for those of you who are my age and older, remember choose your own adventure books, you could go backwards and forwards. It doesn't mean that you went straight through, but you had to go towards the end of the book. It was driving towards something. And that meaningful climax doesn't even mean that we absolutely understand the end of the story. If you remember Lost in Translation, we don't really know what Bill Murray says to Scarlett Johansson at the end of the movie, but it's still a climax, and it still makes us feel. But when we create these one-off charts, when we create these dashboards, when we create these infographics, we are, 99% of the time, I'm going to argue, not telling stories. We are making a point. We are showing cause and effect, but we are not telling stories. So what are the types of stories that we can tell? And very quickly, I just want to talk about Chris Booker's book, The Seven Basic Plots, which talks about seven story types. Now, if by the end of this talk you're really interested in learning more about story, I want to caution you that everyone who writes in this field decides to write as many words as possible. Uh, Chris Booker's book is like 900 pages, and it's like a six-point font. Uh, Rob McKee's book is like 800 pages. Uh, Joseph Campbell's book I'll show in a minute is like 600 pages. So if you want to learn about this, carve out like a month of your life to just read. Okay, but so Chris Booker's book, he has seven basic plot types. And we could think about these different plot types, and they sort of, they share different similar characteristics, and they share similar structures. But the seven plot types that he talks about are overcoming the monster, rebirth, rags to riches, voyage and return, comedy, tragedy, and the quest. And so you'll see, when you think about your favorite stories, they're going to overlap a little bit. So we can start with, say, um, overcoming the monster. An example might be Star Wars, <clears throat> of Luke Skywalker having to defeat the Empire and, and Darth Vader. Rebirth might be something like Despicable Me, right? Gru is the bad guy, and then he gets, for those of you who've seen kids' movies, right? Uh, the bad guy adopts the three girls, becomes the good guy at the end. Rags to riches, Aladdin, again, if you have kids. Aladdin, right? So we have the poor street urchin at the beginning, ends up falling in love with the princess and, and becomes the prince. Voyage and Return, Wizard of Oz. Comedy, of course, Dumb and Dumber, right? But these, there's still a path here through this story. A tragedy, probably the most famous, Romeo and Juliet. And then finally, probably the, the 
you know, the thing that you would think of first when you think about the quest would be uh, Harold and Kumar go, go to White Castle. <laughs> so now all these stories share certain characteristics, and I don't want to dive into each of those. But when you think about the stories that you love, the stories that you like to read, the stories that you like to tell, they tend to fall into some of these categories, okay? And, there, and there's obviously overlap. For example, Lord of the Rings. It's clearly a quest story, but there's also aspects of overcoming the monster. There's aspects of rebirth. There are aspects of voyage and return. So they share some of these characteristics. Okay, so those are types of story. What about story structure? Well, there are three basic types of story structure that I really like. And again, what I'm gonna show you in the last structure is how it does not apply to data and to data visualization. And so therefore, when we say we're telling stories with data, we're not actually telling stories. So the first structure I wanna show you is Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And in Campbell's structure, what you have is a hero starts from st some status quo, and he works his way around in this sort of story structure that we, that we, in a way in which we can, we can uh, draw it out. So the hero starts in a status quo in the ordinary world, and he's gonna make his way down into a special world. And a special world could be mental, it could be another planet, it could just be another area, right? So Frodo in Lord of the Rings goes from the Shire, goes to Arendelle, goes to Mordor, and makes his way back. So the hero starts with the status quo. There's a call to an adventure. He departs this, the, the ordinary world, goes into the special world, there's some sort of crisis, and then he makes his return, and there's a resolution at the end. This is one way to think about story structure. And so Campbell's book is really focused on traditional folk tales, uh, traditional stories. Another way to think about and to draw out story structure is Kurt Vonnegut's way to look at it. Now, Kurt Vonnegut has a different way to draw out story structure, and I'm gonna show you a short video of him explaining how to think about the structure of stories. The reason why the simple shapes of stories can't be fed into computers, they are beautiful shapes. <coughs> this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now, this is the BE axis. B stands for beginning. <laughs> e stands for electricity. <laughs> now, this is an exercise in relativity, really. The shape of the curves are what matters and not their origins. So we'll start a little above average is why, why get a depressing person? We'll start <coughs> the whole thing. We call this story man in hole, but it needn't be about a man and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole. But it's just a good way to remember it. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. <laughs> they never get sick of it. All right, not copyrighted. Another story is also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer called Boy Gets Girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person, not expecting anything to happen a day like any other. Find something wonderful, just loves it. Oh, God damn it. Got it back again. Okay, so that's another way to think about story. And as people who are working with data and visualizing data, you know, I think we can relate to actually drawing these curves out. The last structure I want to share with you is, is perhaps one of the more famous story structures is Freytag's Pyramid. And so Freytag's Pyramid, you'll notice similarities with the previous two, looks like this. And we start with exposition here in the bottom left, we make our way up to a climax, and then we resolve at the following, at the following side. So exposition is this is the important background information. We have some rising action, so the series of events that build towards the greatest interest. So we start in the Shire with Lord of the Rings, Frodo goes off on his quest, and then we have a turning point that changes his fate as we go into Mordor. And then there's a falling action, the conflict between him and Sauron and, and all the you know, orcs and everybody battles, and then we have a resolution at the end. The conflicts are resolved, the tension's released, the tragedy ends. Okay, so here, this is Freytag's Pyramid. But what can we, whoop, can we apply Freytag's Pyramid to data? So when you think about your stories, you can think about applying any of your favorite stories to this 
Very simple uh, pyramid. Only one ever told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. I mean, the best no of all time, right? Just yelled out. But think about how that story follows that very simple pyramid structure. But now let's apply it to data. And here's where it starts to fall apart. So we start with the exposition. This is the background information. How do we use this applying it to data? Well, again, this might be the space, the axes, the grid lines, the background information. The rising action. What's rising action? Well, here it's probably the data. So we're actually putting the data on the chart. That's the action. And then what's the climax? Well, here it's now, OK, so that's the main insights. And yet most of us just give people graphs. And we say, good luck to you. Here's a graph. Go figure out the most important thing. But, but, but sort of applying it to story structure might be main insights. And then here's where it sort of falls apart. What's falling action in a story structure? It doesn't really work, right? That's just like people going on to the next thing. And then the resolution is really the next steps, but too often we don't actually give people the next steps. We don't ask them to do anything with the information we've given them. So instead of thinking everything is story, I want to build off a uh, interview and blog post by Alberto Cairo who talked about the distinction between annotation, narration, and story. So that when you're thinking about your graphs, instead of calling every visualization you make a story, you can use these other words. Okay, Because our words are important. And when we use this word story flippantly and carelessly, we're not able then to connect with our audience in meaningful ways. So what's annotation? So annotation is where we add things to the graph that help the reader understand or the user understand the different points of the graph. These might be things that help them understand how to read it, but also the content from the graph. The graph. Then we move from annotation to narration. And this is where we start to guide the reader through. So this may be things that we use to guide the reader through a single graph or through a series of graphs to help them understand the point or the argument. And then we move from narration to story, and this is where we add the emotion and the meaningful climax. Okay? Okay, so I want to show you examples of these three. And before I do that, let's think about who's doing these different tasks. So on the annotation side, I think that's where we're matching things with data. So I showed you that line graph with a little bit of text. That's annotation. On the story side, this is where we're talking to people or units or groups. We're un trying to understand their experience and their behavior by actually talking to them, actually hearing what they have to say. So who's doing this work? Well, analysts like you and me, I'm an economist by training, so I stand over here. And so what I do with all of my colleagues every day is we download a bunch of data, we do a lot of research. Yeah, people answer the survey, but we don't ever see those people. And then we never, ever, ever talk to those people. Okay, they just sit back there and we just forget that they exist. And then on the other side, we have you know, journalists or journalist type folk who have traditionally gone out and talked to people. And they go talk to Fred in West Virginia about his experience being unemployed. And what does that experience mean? And then sometimes they buttress that, that discussion with some data. So I want to put these two spectrums together. So I have vertical here. I have data going up from data to people. And then the content producers on the horizontal axis going from analysts to journalists. Now, we as analysts tend to sit down here in this bottom left quadrant, right? We work with data, but we don't talk with people. Journalists, by comparison, sit up there in the top right. They talk to people. And only very recently have journalists started to get more engaged with data, learning to code, learning how to use data. So they're moving, I think, fairly quickly along this line. Whereas we as analysts are still not moving up. And really where we want to be is right in the middle. We don't want to replace either of these. We want them to work together. In a little Twitter exchange I had with Alberto a couple weeks ago, he says journalists need more nuance and less story, and analysts need more story and less needless nuance. It's not about saying, oh, I'm an analyst. I know how to run a regression, and therefore I can't talk to people. It's about pairing the analysis with the people so that, people, so that our reader and our user and our audience care about the content that we are conveying to them. Sarah Cliff at Vox did a, a series of, uh, uh, or did one big article in December of last year, 
about the sort of relationship or the correlation between people who voted for Donald Trump and people who received their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. And she wanted to know why people who would receive their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act would vote for Donald Trump, who promised to repeal it. And so she started by exploring data on those two pieces, counties that were uh, more highly, uh, a larger proportion of people uh, voted for Donald Trump, that also had a high proportion of people who received health insurance. Once she had that, she then went into these counties and talked to people. And when I talked to her about it, she said, data defines the parameters of the story. It's the data that starts and then moves on to these individual interviews. Because it's the stories from these individuals that really makes us care about the impacts of health insurance, the impacts of the economy, the impacts of unemployment. So I want to walk through examples of each, uh, each piece of this spectrum. So let's start with annotation. So this is probably my favorite example of a graph that does, in my opinion, superb annotation. This is a bubble chart from the LA Times. And what it has is, along the horizontal axis, change in the violent crime rate. And in the vertical axis is the change in the property crime rate for about 35 cities in California. Now, you have to think about the average LA Times reader who may not be familiar with the bubble chart. Everyone in this room knows how to read this graph. But the average LA Times reader may have never seen a chart like this before. And so you notice when you look at this graph, there's a big red box in the top right with a big red word that says worse, right? And then in the, in the lower left quadrant, there's a big blue box with a big blue word that says better. So that right away, even the average LA Times reader knows how to read this graph. This stuff is bad, this stuff is good. And now, within each quadrant is a small, short, bold-faced headline and a sentence that explains the content. <clears throat> so that the annotation in this graph both explains how to read the graph, but also how you should get the content out of this graph. Okay, what about narration? So narration is where I think we're guiding the user, guiding the reader through the points we're trying to make. It's still not a story. Okay, so here is an example from the New York Times from a few years ago on rating the ACA success. It's a series of graphs paired with some text. The text helps explain the graph, what's going on, why these countries do this, why this slope looks like this. But it's not a story. Even though you might care about health insurance, it doesn't touch us at an emotional level, nor does it have a meaningful climax because it's not building to something. This is a project I did at the Urban Institute last year on the disability insurance program. Same sort of thing. A series of graphs with text that help explain about the disability insurance program. How benefits have changed, how enrollment has changed, how the geographic distribution looks. But it's not a story. Just because I have a bunch of graphs and a bunch of text doesn't make it a story. All right, so what about story? Again, I think we need two pieces. We need emotion, and we need a meaningful climax. <clears throat> and I think the best example, still to this day, is Snowfall from the New York Times. So released back in 2012, Snowfall was one of the first sort of immersive narrative pieces of journalism that combined traditional storytelling with data visualization, with audio, with video, all integrated together. And we see these now all the time. Everybody creates these and they call them stories, but they're not always stories. They're often just a representation of facts, a representation of data. But I want you to listen to just the first couple paragraphs of Snowfall and tell me that you're not hooked right away into the story. The snow burst through the trees with no warning, but a last second whoosh of sound, a two-story wall of white, and Chris Rudolph's piercing cry, avalanche, Elise. The very thing the 16 skiers and snowboarders had sought, fresh, soft snow, instantly became the enemy. Somewhere above, a pristine meadow cracked in the shape of a lightning bolt, slicing a slab nearly 200 feet across and three feet deep. Gravity did the rest. Snow shattered and spilled down the slope. Within seconds, the avalanche was the size of more than a thousand cars barreling down the mountain and weighed millions of pounds. Moving about 70 miles an hour, it crashed through the sturdy old growth trees, snapping their limbs and shredding bark from their trunks. The avalanche in Washington's Cascades in 
February, slid past some trees and rocks like ocean swells around a ship's prow. Others it captured and added to its sublime flow. Somewhere inside, it also carried people. How many? No one knew. So you read the first couple paragraphs of, of Snowfall, and I don't care how many graphs are in the thing, you want to read it. Because it's already emotional, it's already going to be driving towards something. It's already going to be building something that you care about. Now, it doesn't mean that everything needs to be snowfall, that everything needs to have the interviews with individuals, that we need to combine sound and video and data visualizations. This is the story from the Tampa Bay Times on why schools in Pinellas County are so terrible. And it's basically a scrolly telling, right? It's what we call scrolly telling nowadays. We're scrolling vertically through. And yet this does tell a story because A, it's about kids in education, which we all care about, and B, it's building to something. Over the course as you scroll this, scroll through this, it builds to something and it has a meaningful climax at the end. Telling stories also doesn't mean that you need to be a journalist. This is a project that the Urban Institute did a couple of years ago on long-term unemployment. It's called 27 Weeks and County. It took the in-depth, sophisticated, big PDF research report and paired it with interviews with individuals and combined the research with their stories, with their experience, so that we as readers, so the user, can connect with the content in a more emotional and a more meaningful way. Now, many of you may be saying, What's the big deal? I know what story is. When I sit with my colleagues or my clients and my coworkers, they know what story is. I know what a story is. I read stories all the time and it's fine. I don't care that we need a strict definition of the word story. And I think it's important to think about how we use the word story because stories are so meaningful and so impactful that if we were more careful about how we use the word story, and most of the time replace it with the word point, or argument, if we were more careful about the word story, we would be more careful and more purposeful in telling stories. Tyler Cohen uh, once said that stories to work have to be simple, easily grasped, easily told to others, and easily remembered. Those are not very hard things for us to do. We all tell stories all the time. We listen to podcasts, we read books, we watch movies. We know what stories are, and yet somehow the definition of story has fallen apart when we apply it to data, <clears throat> when we apply it to data visualization. We need to be more careful about story because it can be meaningful to both ourselves and to our audience. In his great book, Into the Woods, John York writes, all tales then are at some level a journey into the woods to find the missing part of us, to retrieve it and make ourselves whole. We can better connect with our audience if we think carefully about telling stories. And we are all storytellers. And so if we're able to do so, to combine our in-depth data work, combine our visualizations, and to actually tell stories by talking to people to understand their experience, we can do a better job of communicating our work and encouraging people to make discoveries, find insights, and affect change. Thank you very much. Thank you.